This is the last hour of Physics 1B for December 8th. All right, we're gonna do some Doppler effect problems. Um, let's go ahead and grab our equation so we can use that. I think I zoomed in just a little too far. So here's our equation. Copy, paste, paste, click, click. It's not that we click, but it did paste it, so we'll do that. Okay, so here's our problem. Make it a little bit bigger. All right, a police car siren emits a sinusoidal wave with a frequency of 300 hertz, so that's frequency of source. The speed of sound is 340 meters per second in air, and the air is still. Find the wavelength of the waves if the siren is at rest. Find the wavelength of the waves in front of and behind the siren if it is moving at 30 meters per second. Okay, so we've got a car. And it's sending out waves in all directions. The car is moving, ah, oh, first of all, part A. Find the wavelength of the waves if the siren is at rest. Okay, so lambda is equal to V over F. So if the velocity is 340 meters per second, we divide that by, this is a four, not a nine. Yeah, I'll just fix it. Four, zero, M over S. Uh, we divide that by the frequency of 300 hertz. This will give us our wavelength. Come on. Come on, phone. Don't do that. Okay. 340 divided by 300 equals 1.13. So that is our, we'll call this the wavelength of the source, because that is going to be our source wavelength. Okay. All right. Part B says, uh, find the wavelengths of the waves in front of and behind the siren if it is moving at 30 meters per second. Okay, so now for part B, the let's do the uh, in front of and behind, okay. So let's do in front of first. So we've got our object, it's producing waves. They have a frequency that we call F source. And now it's gonna be moving in this direction here with a velocity that's equal to 30 meters per second. And so if I'm sitting right here and my velocity is zero, velocity observer is gonna be zero, then what do I hear? What kind of frequency do I hear? And then what is the wavelength? Let's do frequency first. So the frequency that the observer will hear is equal to V plus V naught over V minus Vs times Fs. So in this case, V naught is zero. This is the velocity of the source and the velocity of the sound waves that we're gonna be using V is 340. So if we plug everything in here, we're gonna have 340 meters per second minus zero divided by 340, sorry, plus zero, minus zero, whatever, uh, meters per second. Now. Here's where we have to think about what our, our sign conventions are. When the velocity of the source is coming towards the observer, we leave it as it is right here. We don't change anything. Basically, this is gonna be positive. And so that's our equation. And all of that gets multiplied by F source, which is 300. So let's figure out what the frequency observed is. So this is going to be 340 divided by 340 minus 30 equals times 300. So the frequency that you're going to hear here, F observed, is going to be 329 hertz. And of course, we convert that into a wavelength. I'll put it right here. Lambda is equal to V over FO. So this is going to be 340 meters per second divided by F observed, which is 329 hertz, and so lambda, we'll call this lambda observed. Lambda observed is now going to be 340 divided 329, 1.03. So slightly different than before. 1.13 here, and now the observer is seeing a wavelength of 1.03. The next possibility that they're asking us to calculate is suppose that the source is moving in this direction and you're standing over here. 
with as well a velocity of the observer equal to zero. So now what do you hear? So now what's gonna happen is FO again is gonna be equal to V plus V naught divided by V minus VS. But now in this case, because the car is moving away from you, Vs is going to be negative. So this is Fs right here. So now we're going to have 340 meters per second plus zero in the numerator divided by 340 meters per second minus negative 30 because now the car is moving away from us. And all of that also gets multiplied by uh, 300 hertz. So now the frequency of the observed is going to be 340 divided by 370 times 300. So I got 276 now hertz observed. And of course we can use that to find the wavelength again by taking 340 meters per second and then fixing this 4 up. 4 divided by 276 hertz, and that'll give us the observed wavelength of 340 divided by 276 is 1.23. So now the wavelength appears to be slightly longer. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I feel like these problems are pretty easy. The trickiest part, I think, is just making sure you get the sign on VO and VS correct. You know, so just to reiterate, when they're when they're coming towards each other, positive. When they're going away from each other, they're negative. That's pretty much it. You can also have the situation where one's coming towards and one's going away. The one that's going towards is going to be positive. The one that's going away is going to be negative. And uh, that's just pretty much how it works. Anyone have any questions? Can you see how the equation works to make this happen? That when... When Vs is positive, the observed frequency is going to be smaller. And when Vs is negative, you do negative, negative. So you're adding in the denominator, which makes the denominator bigger. So when Vs is negative, that's going to make FO smaller. When Vs is positive, it'll make it bigger. Can you all see that from the equation? You can see it happen here, because this is 340 minus 30, and this is 340 plus 30. So I say that because um, I think that this equation is, is quite intuitive in the sense that if you're wondering about what the sign should be of these, of these things here, just think in your brain what you expect to happen, right? So if the observer is moving towards the source, you expect the frequency to go up. So you'd want that to be positive, right? Because bigger numerator makes it bigger over here, right? Um, but if the observer is moving away, from the source, you'd want the frequency observed to be smaller. So this needs to be negative and vice versa for the denominator because it's the denominator, right? That's why I like this version of the equation better than the one in your textbook, which again, I said I was gonna look during the break and I did and I just still don't. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't tell you anything. All right, whatever, let's keep going. I don't need to make fun of university physics anymore today. All right. Next one, if a listener L is at rest and the siren in 16.14 is moving away from L, at, wait a minute, didn't we just do this? We just did this, right? What? Yeah, 276, we just calculated it. Right, we got 276 somewhere here, right? Yeah, right there. What a strange question, we're not gonna do this one. That's just stupid. Maybe what we'll do is at the end of class, if we have more time, I'll, I'll pull a question from the back of the textbook, which I'll try to find a really hard one that we can do. Because as usual, this book has super simple problems. Um, wait a minute. What? Okay, whatever. These problems are very uninspired. The, uh, the textbook got super lazy when it got to this part, I guess. These problems are just... All right, if the siren is at rest and the listener is moving away from it at 30 meters per second, what frequency the listener here? Okay, so we've got, now the situation is, we've got our observer that's on a skateboard moving incredibly fast at 30 meters per second. This is my velocity of observer is going to be, I'm just gonna put it at negative 30 now because it's saying that it's moving away 
from the siren. Okay, so here's our siren. Wait, are we going to assume the siren's moving still too? Nope, it says the siren's at rest, so now the velocity of the source is going to be zero. Okay, and we still know the frequency of the source was 300. And we want to find the frequency that's observed. And we can do that by using our equation that says that we do V, V minus plus V, S, V, O. Nope, got it backwards again. Oops. Uh, the numerator is the one that has the O, and the denominator is the one that has the S. So there we go. So observer moving away, frequency of this being produced. So frequency observed now is going to be, was it 340 for this one? I think we were using 340, right? Yeah. Velocity of sound is 340 plus V naught, but that's going to be plus a negative 30 because he's going away. Divide by V minus Vs, which will be 340 minus 0. You technically don't have to put the units here with this because it's a ratio, right? So you really could just put 340 minus 30 over 340 for all I care. Only because it's a ratio. All right, Fs is 300. All right, so let's see how much this changes it. Let's see if we get a new frequency or if this is going to be one of the same ones from before. This is something interesting about Doppler effect is that it actually distinguishes between which thing is moving. Okay, so we're not going to get an answer that's similar to one of the answers we got before. We're actually going to get a brand new frequency here, although it's going to be close. It's misleadingly close, actually. I get 274 hertz. But if you compare to the answers we got in the previous problem, right, we got, what did we get? We got frequencies of 329 and a frequency of 276. And I would say that if you compare what's happening in this picture here to what's happening in this picture here, you know, you might say, well, it's the same thing because in this picture, the relative velocity of the car to the, the person is 30 meters per second away, right? And in this person here, picture here, the relative velocity of the car is 30 meters per second away, right? But notice that you get a different answer. You get 276 and you get 274. And they're not just close, they are different. They're specifically different. Because the Doppler effect actually can detect effectively which thing is moving. You see what I mean? Like there's a difference between a source emitting a sound and someone moving away from it versus a source emitting a sound while the car is moving away. Like they seem like the same idea, right? You think you get the same answer, but you don't because they're different, right? And the calculation is different too. Here we did 340 over 340 minus or plus 30. And here we did 340 minus 30 over, see what I mean? So that's a really unique thing about the Doppler effect. And it's part of why we can use it to measure speeds of cars and why we can use it to measure speeds of like particles of weather, you know, clouds and stuff like that as we're trying to detect the direction that a storm's moving, which is what you're doing um, when you're uh, when using a Doppler radar. So it's definitely a very interesting thing. And one of the ways in which wave properties can behave a little bit different than particle properties, right? Because if instead of a wave being thrown here, um, we replace the wave with a gun. And let's say that this person, I know this is kind of dark, but let's say that this uh, um, might be dark, but also accurate. Let's suppose that this is a police car and they're gonna shoot this person as they're running away. Maybe it's a fugitive of some kind and you know how police love to shoot people. So if you fire a bullet and this person's moving away at a speed of 30 meters per second, let's say the bullet's moving at a very slow 100 meters per second, then the speed that the bullet's gonna hit the person will be 100 minus 30, which is 70, right? And same thing would be here. Suppose that I'm the car is driving away but it fires a bullet backwards at this person here and it fires a bullet 100 meters per second in this direction but the car is moving at 30 meters per second in this direction. Well, the bullet's actually going to come out at 70, right? So it's it's a um, perfectly symmetric situation where it doesn't matter if the person's moving away here or if the car's moving away, the bullet is still going to travel at the same relative speed, right? But waves are different. Uh, they're just different because they have this property called frequency that we can detect. And that is the property that changes things. The wave itself is still moving according to the laws of physics, right? I mean, this is technically the observed speed of the wave for this person, right, is the, the observed speed of the wave is this, 340 minus 30. Um, but the frequency is a different property, right? Okay, does anyone have any questions? No. All right, so the last one of these uh, example problems here we'll do. And then, I, like I said, we'll, we'll grab a problem from the back of the textbook that I think is good, and we'll try that one as a way to uh, finish things up here because we're going to be 
way ahead of schedule. I thought this would take a lot longer tonight, but I guess we kind of covered most of the difficult stuff in this chapter um, on Monday. Okay, Doppler effect four, moving source, moving listener. These are the more interesting ones where both things are moving. So the siren is, oh my God, it's literally the exact same problem again. Okay. The siren is moving away from the listener with a speed of 45 meters per second relative to the air, and the listener is moving towards the siren with a speed of 15 meters per second relative to the air. What's important here is relative to the air because, you know, the air is um, the air is the medium of the wave, and if, if the air itself was moving, we'd have to add that to the, the wave speed. All right. What frequency does the listener hear? Okay, so this situation, we've got siren. Um, the siren's moving away. So the velocity of my source is this way, and my velocity for my person, the listener is moving towards, right? Okay, so the listener is going this way. So VO this way. Okay, so our convention is that when the, when the thing is moving toward the other thing, whether it's over or source, you get a positive speed, okay? So VO is gonna be positive 15. And Vs, because Vs is going away from the other thing, is going to be negative 45. And as long as you can take the time to figure that stuff out, you'll do really well in these kind of problems. And there'll be something like this on the final for sure. So now frequency observed is, what's it? it's V plus V over V minus V. And you just got to remember which is on top. I always, I think it's the source on bottom and the O on top. I guess you can think about it as alphabetical O is before s, so o above s, right? O comes before s, yeah, it does. And we put f, s over here. I was thinking of another way to memorize it, but it doesn't matter. All right, so then we get f o is going to be equal to. Aren't these problems easy? All you do is just plug these things in. It's so easy. V o is fifteen, so we have. Here, let's do it without putting units in. We don't get to do that very often. 340 minus or plus 15 over 340 minus negative 45. So you can see how the fact that this car is moving away is gonna make it so that the frequency observed is gonna be a little bit smaller. And we multiply by our frequency here, which was 30 Hertz, right? And so we get F observed is equal to, so 340 plus 15 be 355. We divide that by 340 plus 45 equals times 300. And I get 277, which is the right answer. And again here, we get a completely new answer, even though the relative velocity in this case would be 30 again, actually. Same relative velocity, but again, we get a new answer. So that's it. That's the Doppler effect. Hopefully it doesn't seem too mystifying to you. Um, let's see if we can find a question where it uh, where it gets it wrong. Oh, one thing I want to mention too, and your book your book mentions this as well, is that for light, the Doppler effect looks a little bit different. For the light, it is f observed is equal to the square root of c minus V over C plus V times FS. And in this case, what are the Vs? It's just the velocity of the observer, right? It's the source velocity. Okay. So V here represents velocity of source. So it actually becomes positive negative when it's going towards. You know what? We're going to use our same notation then. We're not even going to use theirs because your book, of course, likes to just switch things up immediately for no apparent reason. It, it's really this, the way the book does this stuff is just insanely, I mean, it's, it's almost criminal. Um, so in this case, V would be velocity of source toward the, so this would be the approach velocity. And if it's going away, you just make it negative. Um, and... 
it's kind of interesting to me that it that it puts this in here at this point. The book I recommend is this one. Physics for Scientists and Engineers with Modern Physics. I think this is the best kind of physics textbook out there at this level. I've seen some other ones that are okay. I like Knight okay, but um, I think that that one's really good. It's by Surway and Jewett. So Surway is the author. Just look for Surway. S-E-R. S-E-R-W-A-Y. A whole lot of the problems in your guys, in your lab manual actually come from this, come from Surway. Anyway, so this is the equation for light waves. And I don't think I'm going to give you any problems with it. I just want you to understand that um, light waves have a slightly different equation. And you'll learn the reason why when you take physics 1D. It's because of relativity. It's because the speed of light is constant for all observers. So light acts a little bit different. Whereas the speed of sound can be affected by the motion of the observer. The speed of light itself cannot, but the observed frequency can change anyway. Um, interestingly enough... One of the effects of the Doppler effect for light is that um, when the source is moving away, okay, for light, when the source moves away, that leads to the frequency going down. The frequency observed goes down, okay? And in terms of light, that means you go to the red, okay? So we call this effect a red shift. I'm sure some of you have heard this term before, red shift. Who here has heard the term red shift before? Red shift. Red shift. Anyone heard that before? You have Jacob asked, yeah. Doppler red shift, yeah. So think about this. So, so this is a really important thing in the history of physics. Doppler effect is just massively important. So imagine we're looking at a, a distant galaxy, right? And we look at the light from the galaxy, okay? We kind of know what that light's supposed to look like, uh, meaning that the vast majority of the energy that's being produced is being produced in stars. And those stars are primarily made up of hydrogen and helium. And so what we can do is we can look at the light coming from the distant galaxy, and we can pass it through something called a spectrometer, and we can look at, we can look at the light, right? And we can actually see just how much the light is shifted over from what it should be. And this guy named Edwin Hubble, who I'm sure you all have heard of Hubble before, uh, the person whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named after, he did a bunch of calculations here in California, I believe, right? At Mount Wilson, maybe? I think it was at Mount Wilson. It was at, at the observatory there that he was doing these observations. And what he figured out was that when he looked at all of the galaxies around us, right, the vast majority of them uh, appeared to be redshifted, okay? And what does that mean? Well, if, if we look at a galaxy, the galaxy is the source, and if the source is redshifted, then we can conclude that the galaxy is moving away, right? And he was shocked to find that almost every single galaxy that he looked at had a redshift. Only the ones that were very, very close to us had a, had a blue shift, and even then, most of them had a redshift, right? And so he's like, that, that's crazy, that's really weird. How can it be the case that I look at every single other galaxy and every one of them looks like it's moving away from us? So you can basically take away from that one of two things. If when you look at all the other galaxies, they're moving away from you, you could say, oh, you know what? They were right with the whole Bible thing that God created heaven and earth just for us, right? And we're right here in the center of the universe. Or you could, uh, you could be more open-minded and say, no, that doesn't make any sense. We're not just in the center and everything's moving away from us. It must be the case that we're not at a preferred location. And any other galaxy that we would be in, if we look back at our galaxy, it would look like it was moving away too. And so we have to assume that any other race of aliens or whatever that was that was looking at the universe, they'd see the same thing. So he concluded that the universe itself, space itself, must be stretching everything apart. It's the only way that everything will be redshifted is if, 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 if space itself is actually expanding. Um, and so this is where we come up with the idea that the universe is expanding. And not only that, he also figured out that the farther away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. Had a bigger, even bigger redshift, right? And... Um, he used this to, to basically prove the universe is expanding. Um, and, uh, and nowadays, the amount by which something is redshifted is actually an indication of how far away it is. So redshift tells us distance now, which is really fascinating. It's, it allows us to figure out distances in space. Because when you go up and look at the night sky here in California when it's not so cloudy outside, 
it looks like all the stars are the same distance away, right? You really can't tell the, how far away one is versus the other one because they're all just dots on an apparently flat surface, right? Or a spherical surface, what do you want to think about it? But redshift, the Doppler effect, it allows us to know all kinds of information about distant galaxies. And um, yeah, so this is also why, were we talking about this in this, were we talking about the, the James Webb Space Telescope in this class? It was my other class, it was my other class. So the James Webb Telescope is going up and it, it looks in the, it, it's, it's going to be an IR telescope. And it's going to allow us to see uh, farther back in time than we ever have before because it's going to be able to see light that's been redshifted into the IR, into the infrared. Anyway, so let's, um, anyone have any questions or comments? Doppler effect, very powerful. Very, very powerful instrument we have in physics for determining, you know, cops use it to determine how fast you're moving. And astronomers use it to determine how fast other galaxies are moving. 13.5 billion years back. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. That number, if anybody doesn't know, is approximately what the age of the universe is. Okay. Um, let's, let's find another problem to do, because those problems were just way too easy. I mean, Doppler effect problems are generally not that hard. You know what? Let's, let's find a problem from this book. This book's way better. It's going to have good problems. In fact, their example problems are better, too. I very commonly use example problems from their uh, from this textbook. Let's see if we can find a good one here. Ooh, Cherenkov radiation. That's an interesting one. Um, okay, additional problems. Let's see if we can find a good one. Something, I remember this one being kind of good. Yeah. Changed my mind. Maybe we'll do this one. Wait, here we go. How about this one? Overtaking a car, please don't have to so the wavelength in the air. So it's, eh. it's also basically the same. There are all these can tend to be kind of, let's go back to the section on Doppler effect and see if some of these are good. 42 frequency, cars moving the same direction. Yeah, it's about the same. I'm trying to find one where like they bounce off. Uh, Sandy crosswalk, your frequency. Here we go, this is a good one. Let's do this one. All right, going to got to start paint, paste. All right, let's try this one out. Just a slightly different problem is all. Not particularly difficult, but it's just slightly different. Okay, standing in a crosswalk, you hear a frequency of 560 hertz from the siren of an approaching ambulance. After the oh, this is a really good one. I love these ones. These ones are great. Okay, back to where I can see you guys. Can we talk about breaking the sound barrier? Sure, we can talk about that. Um, okay, stand at a crosswalk. You hear a frequency of 560 hertz. So F observed is 560 hertz when it's approaching. So when approaching. And you hear a frequency F observed, we'll call it F observed prime when it passes, which is 480 hertz. Okay, so in this case, the ambulance is going towards you. In this case, the ambulance is going away from you. So you're here, you're standing here. And our goal is to figure out what is its velocity. Okay, what is the velocity? The velocity of the source is what we're going to try to calculate here. Okay, so let's write down two different equations. The first equation will be f observed equal to, uh, velocity of observer in this case is equal to zero, so we don't need to worry about that one. So it's, what is it? It's v plus v over v minus v, and then we go o, and then we go s, and then we go fs right here. Okay, so f observed is going to be equal to this, where this is zero. Now our goal is to find that, right? Our other equation is going to be f observed is equal to, um, we'll just put V in the numerator over V minus VS. But now let's see. When the person's approaching, our VS is going to be, we're going to leave it like this. But when the car is going away, we'll put a plus sign right here. Right? And there we go. 
And we'll use velocity of sound, I guess. We'll have to pick a velocity for sound. I guess we'll pick V equal to 344. That's what we'll use. All right. And this is going to be FO prime. So we want to solve for VS. That's our question. What is VS equal to? So let's get to solving for it. Let's divide these two equations by each other. So we'll do FO over FO prime should be equal to um, V over V minus VS times FS over V over V plus VS times FS. Frequency of the source will disappear. And it looks like this cancels out as well. So what we end up getting is this is equal to, we'll flip these, V plus VS over V minus VS. And now we just need to solve and kind of unpack this until we get um, VS by itself. Um, so we'll do that by saying V plus VS times FO prime is equal to V minus VS times FO. And we'll multiply things out. So we get FO prime V plus FO prime VS equals FO V minus FO VS. And now we just We're getting some negative, negative thing happening. I hope this works out. F O. You know what? I think I can avoid the negative signs. Let's do that. So on the left hand side, let's add this one over here. So we'll have F O V S plus F O prime V S equals F O V minus F O prime V. So that then we can factor out V S from this side. And then Vs will be equal to Fo minus Fo prime divided by Fo plus Fo prime multiplied by V. So what do we have? Fo was 560, Fo prime was 480. So 560 minus 480 divided by 560 plus 480 multiplied by 344. And that should give us our velocity of our source. So, yeah, this is a way better problem, right? Way trickier. Not, it's not, I mean, it's not like it's hard. It's just, so 560 minus 480 equals that divided by 560 plus 480. I love how, I'm just such a nerd when it comes to algebra, but I, I really love the symmetry that occurs here where we start with this equation here, right? And we eventually solve. And if you look, look how similar this equation looks to this equation, you know, like it's like the frequencies just change places with the velocities, right? I really like that a lot. This is like this plus this over this minus this, and then it eventually it becomes frequency differences instead of velocity. You know? I don't know why I like that so much, but I do. Three, four, four. So twenty six point five meters per second. That's what I get. And I think that's the right answer. Who knows? I could have gotten it wrong. But you know what, actually? We might be able to check it. If it's an odd number, we can check it. It is 43, so what is this? 17.43. It is so possible I got it wrong, so let's check. 17. Oops. 17.43. 20, we got it exactly right. Nice. Actually, I got 26.5. I never know how they I never know how they come up with these numbers. It's always mine's always off by just a little bit, as I'm sure happens to you too. Anyway, there we go. Hey, by the way, if anybody wants a copy of this book, I think I can just do that. Someone was asking about this. If you, if you want to download it, go for it. Does that work? Did it work? Do I have to push enter? I don't know. Or is it, do I push the plus button? Upload file. And then click on desktop. There we go. I think that'll work. Did it work? Oh, the first one actually worked. I guess what I did the first time actually worked. I didn't realize that this worked. There we go. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, that's the sixth edition, which is an older one, which I guess you could grab too if you want. Anyway, it's it's a really good textbook for sure. I'm sure they love the fact that I'm sharing it to a Discord server, but I don't really care. What are they gonna do about it? Are they gonna watch this whole video and <laughs> Nope, no chance. Alright, um Clear the box, then press enter. I mean it worked. Oh. I did have to push enter. You're right. Okay, thank you. Okay, well that's all that I oh, you wanted me to talk about shockwaves, didn't you? Sorry. So um the the question you had was to talk about what sonic booms or wait what did you what was your question exactly? Jacob said breaking the sound barrier, right? So breaking the sound barrier occurs whenever you have someone like let's say in a plane. Um, usually this occurs in planes, like a jet. If you're traveling in a plane, if the velocity of the plane is greater than the velocity of sound, then you you break the sound barrier. And what happens is that there's like this um, shockwave that occurs. And the shockwave with a plane, I'll show you some pictures of it, kind of looks like this. But I, I feel like it's, it's like a three-dimensional kind of con con conal shockwave that occurs when this occurs. For me, this is really hard to picture, although I'll show you some pictures here in a second of it. Um, what's easier to understand is a boat on the water. This is much easier to observe. Um, you can observe it as long as you just see any boat moving through the water, you'll see this. So if I have a boat, okay, and it's traveling through the water, right? It's moving in this direction. Let's say this is my water, so the surface of the water is here. You all know that a boat produces something called a wake, right? Um, when the boat is traveling, there is this wake thing that kind of comes out from behind the boat. And the reason why this happens is because the velocity of the boat is greater than the velocity of the water waves. So pretty much a sonic boom or a shock wave, we call this a shock wave. Technically, these are both shock waves, but usually we just call this a wake. It's a shock wave though. It always will happen if the velocity of the object is greater than the velocity of um, a wave within the medium. So you get a shock wave with sound when you break the sound barrier because sound travels through air. And when you go faster than air, then this can occur. And it also happens in water when you travel faster than the velocity of water waves. You do not get a wake if the boat moves very slow. Um, where I come from uh, in Oklahoma, all, all the lakes and stuff like that, where people keep their boats in the docks, um, when you're leaving the little marinas where your where your boat is, it'll say um, no wake. Have, has anyone seen that? Is that something you all see around here? Do you go out in the into like a lake or something like that? Has anyone ever seen that before? When you're like in a marina, you've seen that before. Yeah, no wake. And the way you don't get a wake is you go really, 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 really slow. And uh, anyway, so that's breaking the sound barrier. Let me show you what a picture of what it looks like. Um, I think this will work. These things look super cool. Ah, I see it's the name of a transformer. I didn't know that. There we go. Isn't that cool? Look at that. It's like this big cone. It's like a three-dimensional wake, right? This is a nice one. This is a nice picture here. The idea is that when when the when the plane is stopped and it's producing sound waves, they look like this. When the plane's going below the speed of sound, they look like this. And then when you go faster than the speed of sound, what happens is that um, you know you produce a wave, but you're going faster than it, so the wave kind of it kind of looks like this, and the shock wave is these lines right here that occur. So yeah. Anyway, look at that cone. Isn't that cool? These pictures are great. There's another one. There's another one. Anyway, that's a nice one. I think it's only visible for just a second, you know? I think you only see it for just a moment. So I'm pretty impressed these pictures can even capture it. And of course, when you do this, there's a huge sound. That's called a sonic boom. So, okay, that's all I have for you all. Um, our next class will be the final exam. The final exam is gonna have some problems from chapter 15, some problems from chapter 16. 
Uh, in addition, I'm gonna get I'm gonna give you six problems this time instead of just five. So you you still will only need to do four. So uh, that I hope that'll help you. But you can definitely expect some stuff with waves, mechanical waves, standing waves kind of stuff. You can expect um, some kind of maybe Doppler effect or kind of sound problem. I don't know, Louis, but probably. I think that's correct, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. They're going so fast that they would be escape. They basically are escaping the sound wave, right? So I think it's possible they don't hear it, but I could be wrong. Um, I've never done it before, so we'd have to ask a fighter pilot or go look on the internet, I guess. Um, but then uh, beyond that, beyond chapters 15 and 16, we're also going to be covering everything, right? So you can expect stuff from fluid mechanics, uh, you know, stuff like Bernoulli's principle, you know, variation of pressure with depth, stuff like that. You can expect stuff with like heat engines, um, ideal gas stuff, you know, all this, all the stuff we've learned this semester. Um, definitely a good idea to try to reread the textbook, redo old homework problems. That's definitely the best way to study. Okay. Anyone have any questions about the final? It's Monday night. It's Monday night when our final is. Any questions at all? I just said there'll be six questions, Louis, but again, you're only gonna have to answer four. So it's gonna have the same format as the previous exams, except I'll give you one extra problem. To That way, you know, you just have to solve four, so you just pick which four you, you, you feel like they're the strongest in and then solve those. You know, this last exam, everyone, problem similar stuff, yeah, yep, just like that, just like before. Um, everyone seemed to think the last exam was really hard, but it seemed like people did pretty well. There were some low scores for sure, but people did really well. Y'all did, y'all did a good job with this, those problems. Any other questions? I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording then. I'll get it up on YouTube. Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed having everyone in class. I'm glad we actually got to go on campus and do some labs and stuff this semester. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll see some more of you in the spring. Okay, Professor, I'm sorry, I have a couple questions. So um, as far as the lab goes, well, when uh, is age 15? Uh, just the last lab. When when would that be due? Um, just by next Friday, I guess. Okay. 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 That way I can. Okay. All right. And um, I I guess for the for the final, like you just said, it's cumulative. Uh, so I just everything, right? Just study everything, right? I mean, everything. It's not gonna be like, it's not gonna be like down to like the, the you know the final end of chapters type. Oh, of we're still cumulative. recording. I'm sorry. One second.